So I have reviewed the GK68 a while back, a 65% mechanical keyboard that had a weird spaceship looking case. It was alright overall, but I wasn't a fan of the look. There is now a new model of this keyboard, the GK68 XS. Alongside a new case that looks a lot better, it also supports Bluetooth connectivity and has the option for a split spacebar layout that you can change yourself. Pretty cool stuff. This keyboard was sent my way by Epo Maker, and they're currently selling on Kickstarter, so we'll see if it's worth the money and if you should consider backing this project. So let's go. In the box, you get the keyboard in the felt case. There's also a USB-C cable, additional keycaps, a switch puller, a wire keycaps puller, and a replacement plate to change the spacebar to a split layout. The USB cable is thicker than usual for GK keyboards, and it has what seems to be metal endings. And as for keycaps, they're including macOS Legends replacements and keycaps for the split spacebar layout. Finally, for the split spacebar plate, the stabilizers are pre-installed and are lightly lubed. One of the most impressive part of this keyboard is the case. This aluminum case is very heavy, the whole thing weights over 1.2 kilograms or 2.7 pounds. It's machined from a single block of aluminum and then anodized, and the finish looks very nice. All corners have a 45 degree angle chamfer design, which I think looks great, at least much better than the original GK68. The space gray color has a nice shade, although I would probably not go with the purple version if I were to buy one, unless I have a keycap set that match better the color, instead of this white gray and red one they included. It looks very similar to the 60% case that sells on AliExpress for $85, although with a 65% format in this case. At the back, there is a USB-C port with a decent cutout, so it should accommodate most third-party cables. Then, under it, there are four rubber dots, nothing too fancy and no feet for angle adjustment, although I found the default angle to be comfortable. Looking at the layout, it's pretty close to most typical 65% layouts. It's only one unit wider than a 60% keyboard, and you get dedicated arrow keys too. It's not perfectly NC standard, as the bottom right modifiers are 1 unit wide instead of 1.25, and the right shift key is 1.75 units wide. Although these are pretty standard for most 65% keyboards, and it shouldn't be too hard to find a keycap set with those unconventional keys. One thing that I don't like is that the tilt key is between the plus and backspace keys. I really wish they had switched that key and the backspace key. That would have been closer to a standard layout, although it won't affect compatibility with other keycap sets. Speaking of keycaps, the one they include are really great. The description says they have a GSA profile, but it doesn't seem to be a real thing, and in reality it definitely looks like a DSA or XDA profile. So all rows have the same profile, but they feel great and I didn't have issues adapting to this flatter profile. They are PBD, so they will not shine as easily as equivalent ABS keycaps, and they're also fairly thick and the legends are dye sublimated, so again, a very durable process that should last a long time. I really like the theme on the grey keyboard, I think it suits well the color of the case, but on the purple one, I'd personally replace them for something that looks better, although the quality is realistically the same. The units I was sent came with Cherry switches, but this keyboard will be offered with both Cherry and Gateron options. They have clear top housings with milky bottoms, so RGB LEDs shine through nicely. The browns are just a tad tactile, like Cherry browns usually are, and the reds are smooth, less scratchy than Gateron's I found, but there are better options on the market for sure. I replaced them for Gateron browns I had on hand, apart from WASD and the stabilized keys where I kept cherry reds, just for fun. If you plan to replace the switches, I'd recommend going with the Gateron's kit anyway, as it's like $4 more than the barebone kit, and it's always nice to have spare switches on hands. They are mounted on a glass fiber plate, and it's the first time I come across a top plate made from that material. It's pretty much the same material as a PCB, I think, and the sound it produces will be lower pitched than aluminum as a comparison. However, it flexes quite easily, and I guess it does the job, but I'm not a big fan of the orange stroke around every cutout. The PCB under supports 5-pin switches, so that's cool, as most higher-end switches are 5-pin, so you won't need to permanently clip the extra plastic pins with this keyboard. So I went ahead and removed all the switches, and although cherry switches get a bit of backlash sometimes, 
I have to say that they are way easier to install and remove from hot swap keyboards than Gatterons. I don't know if it's the little clips or the overall dimensions of the housings, but they're great for that. Something interesting to note is that although the PCB supports 5-pin switches, the pre-install switches are 3 pins only. The plate can be removed by unscrewing all screws. There's a bunch of them, but that's because they are screwing both in the case and in the PCB. Looking at the PCB, it has 5 standoffs and it's not required to unscrew them, although on the purple unit, I had to unscrew the two bottoms ones as the nuts were stuck at the bottom of the case. They add a tiny bit of glue and it glued the nut to the bottom of the case for some reason. One thing to note too is that the purple keyboard is wired only, so although the case has a section for a battery, it is empty. Also comparing both PCBs, the one with Bluetooth support has an additional chip soldered on it, and it has a battery connector soldered there. So if you plan to use the keyboard wirelessly, I'd suggest going with the wireless option right away to prevent additional soldering down the line. As for the battery, it has a 1900 milliamp power capacity, exactly the same as the Ampro 2. One thing that sets this keyboard apart is that you can replace the spacebar with a 3 key setup, where you can remap one or two of these keys to act as something else than spacebars, which is cool. To do so, I had to install the included split plate instead of the pre-installed plate that would accept the full width spacebar. It's pretty straightforward, as the stabilizers are pre-installed and they were also pre-lubed, although not as much as the ones that are pre-installed on the board. One thing to note is that you will need two additional switches to change this layout, and they were not included in the box. I do hope they include them in the future, as that's really unfortunate to not have all the parts you need to perform this change yourself. The right width keycaps and additional stabilizers are included though. So now to the LEDs. This keyboard offers perky lighting, as well as LEDs at the bottom of the PCB. With aluminum or plastic cases, these are not visible, but I've seen variants of the GK61XS online with a polycarbonate case where the lights would be visible. Not sure if that's something we'll see with the GK68XS at some point. Function plus backspace turns on and off the lights, then function plus arrow up and down will adjust the brightness, and the left and right arrow keys will adjust the speed of the animations. Function plus open bracket will go through the onboard light effects that are reactive to sound as the keyboard has a built-in mic. And then function plus closing bracket will go through light effects that can be changed with the software, although there are default ones on board. As for other controls, you get media controls with function and ASDFGH, the function key row is also accessible with function plus the number row, and you can switch between four profiles with function plus Q, W, E, R, where Q is the driver profile, matching the software's config, and the other three profiles are stored on board. Finally, function plus Z, X, C lets you connect and switch between Bluetooth devices. These three keys correspond to the three devices that can be connected at once. By holding down function plus one of those keys, it puts the keyboard in pairing mode, and once paired, switching to a device can be achieved by just pressing the key combo. Hitting function plus space will switch between wired and wireless connectivity, so it's quite easy to switch between wireless peripherals, but also to switch from wired to wireless. It uses the Bluetooth 5.1 protocol, so it's energy efficient and low latency, and for typing it was good enough, even for me as a full-time developer. There were no keystrokes that got mixed up, nor perceivable delays that would be annoying. But as always, for gaming, I would recommend going wired, as Bluetooth in itself can introduce a decent amount of unpredictable latency, even in the best scenarios. Connecting the keyboard to my Mac initially was a charm, 
It reconnects fairly fast when I start typing on the keyboard after sleeping, until it wouldn't connect anymore, and then any connection attempt required me to enter a code, which never registered. Same thing with my iPhone, it always resulted in an unsuccessful pairing. I was able to get it working again by resetting the keyboard with function escape and Q. After that, pairing over Bluetooth didn't require a code and I was able to connect the keyboard successfully, even with two devices. Now, as for configuration, this keyboard is compatible with the GK software. And this software is really a love-hate thing. In a way, it gives a lot of flexibility and it's quite complete in terms of what you can do with it, but it's not super intuitive. As an example, you can create custom light animations with it, but given how complex it is, you might be better off choosing from the available ones. The thing is, I was only able to remap the five light presets that are on rotation with function plus closing bracket. I was unable to assign a default light effects per layer, like previous GK keyboards allowed. Although they didn't have the five light setting rotation thing before. As for remapping, there are a few restrictions like core controls, such as profile key combos or Bluetooth controls, and you can't remap the function key either, but otherwise it's quite complete. You get a total of four layers. You can assign most key controls like regular keys, Mac keys, mouse controls, media controls, macros, and temporary layer switch keys. As an example, I set it to the bigger split spacebar key, so when it's held down, I have access to the second layer. Otherwise, it's pretty standard, what you would expect from the GK6X Plus software. One thing to note is that you might have to uninstall previous versions of the software for the keyboard to be recognized. So overall, I think this is a really nice keyboard. It checks all the boxes, great loop stabilizers out of the box, hot swap switch sockets, wireless capabilities, the aluminum case is very nice and the keycaps are great too. It has a relatively standard layout and it is customizable quite in depth. The things I don't like are the backspace key being one key off. I'd prefer if they switched it with the tilt key instead. I would prefer if it was QMK compatible, although the GK software is not really limiting in the end. But my biggest worries are with Bluetooth glitches where a key code is required and it won't connect. If that comes back often over time, I would end up using it wired only to save myself the hassle, and it would have been money wasted to go with the wireless option. So that wraps it up for today. I'll have links to this exact keyboard down below for you to check out on Epo Maker's website. Please let me know what you think about it down below. Are you considering getting it? And would you want me to review the GK61XS and GK64XS while we're at it? I'll also mod this exact GK68XS in a future video, so stay tuned for that. So thank you for watching, make sure you leave a like if you did, and don't forget to subscribe, as I'll see you in the next video.